Hello and welcome to the A to J author portion of the 2019 online document assembly training put on in partnership with Law Help Interactive, A to J author, and Capstone Practice Systems. I'm Jessica Frank, A to J author's project manager. The A to J author portion of this training series is four videos long. In video one, we covered how document assembly works, A to J author and hot docs working together. In video two, we covered the overview of A to J author and basic question design. Video three covers macros, functions, repeat loops, and advanced conditions. Finally, video four covers the A to J DAT, our document assembly tool. You can find all the videos on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash A to J author. This is video three in the series. Today we're going to talk about macros, functions, repeat loops, and advanced logic. First up are macros and functions. For variable macros, we'll talk about what they are, how to format them in A to J author, where you can use them in an A to J guided interview, and how to customize your interview using them. For functions, we'll talk about what they are, where you can use them in an interview, then we'll cover seven specific function examples, and finish off with syntax reminders and additional resources where you can find more information about the other functions available in A to J author. Starting with variable macros, let's talk about what they are. They are a way to call up the value of a variable in the question text, a learn more, both the prompt and the help, in field labels, radio button labels, and signposts. You can use information the end user has already given you to personalize the information, remind them of past answers, or specify when they are making a follow-up choice. Here's the format for including a variable macro in an A to J guided interview. Where you want to use it, you type in double percent sign, bracket, the name of the variable, close bracket, double percent sign. So where can you use a variable macro? You can use them in the question text itself, within Learn More's, both in the prompt, that's the question the user avatar thinks, and the help, which is the reply the guide avatar gives. You can use them in radio buttons and field labels and in signposts. This is an example of a variable macro used in the question text. It calls out the user's name, which was given in a previous question, to personalize the interview for them. This simple addition can go a long way towards making an interview feel customized to a specific end user. This is commonly commented on in user feedback as increasing the user's confidence and comfort level with the authoring tool. Here is a variable macro in a learn more prompt. In this example, the end user gave you the name of their agent and you asked a follow-up question of whether they'd like that person to be their children's guardian as well. In the example, you can use the agent's name already saved in the answer file instead of just saying, why would I want the agent to be my children's guardian too? It clarifies the object of the sentence in a quick and easy way for the end user. This is an example in a learn more prompt. It's the reply the guide avatar gives to the end user's question in the previous slide. It again serves as an easy reminder to the end user about who you are talking about. Instead of generically named options for your end user to pick from, you can use variable macros to use specific names that they have already given you. This example relied on asking the end user the name of two people that they would like to make their agent. Then a follow-up question shown here that asks which one of those two they would want to make their primary agent. The format here is the same as the other screens. Double percent sign, bracket, name of variable, close bracket, double percent signs. This just shows the same sort of thing with a field label. They said Jane Doe is their primary agent. Now they can clarify what legal powers to give to Jane to avoid confusion with their secondary agent. It takes very little time for you as an author to add these little extra touches that greatly reduce the confusion an end user may experience while completing complicated legal paperwork. Finally, you can add variable macros to step signs as a final icing on the cake. For example here, I use the user's name and the word hello to address the sign to them specifically. You could do something like Allison's information instead of plaintiff's information once they tell you that the plaintiff's name is Allison. You can do more than simply use a variable macro to insert an end user's name in a simple question. For example, in a repeat loop, it's particularly helpful to call out the name um, or whatever that piece of information is that you're looking for. Um, you collect the name first and then you move on with the follow-up. 
If the end user is entering multiple people, it helps them greatly remember who specifically you're asking that follow-up question on. You can display information collected in a repeat loop to the end user and learn more. So for example, if you have a question that says, do you want to add any more assets to the list you've given me? You can have a learn more that says, what assets have I already told you about? And then in the help, you can use a variable macro to call out all of the assets they've already entered. So for example, it can say, you've already told me about your house, your car, your boat, and your jet ski. And instead of using a slash, like for child slash children, or asset with the S in parentheses, or is slash R, because you're not sure what the proper word is, you can use what information the end user has given you, like how many children they have, to set a new variable called child or children TE to the correct word, either child or children, and then use that in a macro, in a follow-up question about their children or about their child. Same thing goes for asset. If there's one, if they give you one, then you can set it to the word asset. If they give you more than one, you can set it to the word assets. Um, same thing for is or are. You can use the proper um, word in place of the slash by using a variable macro. Now let's talk about functions. So what is a function? The function is a built-in action performed to alter data collected. So data is collected from the end user and stored in variables. Functions allow you to manipulate that data within the variables. You need to wrap the variable name in brackets when there is a space in the variable name itself. So here the format is function, whatever the function is that you're going to be using, and we'll talk about seven specific ones next, parentheses, brackets, name of the variable, close brackets, close parentheses. The most common place to use functions is in the advanced logic section. Here's an example of a function that calls out the user's age based on their date of birth and then uses it in logic to test whether they are over 18 years old or not. If they aren't, they're taken to a follow-up question that says they don't qualify to complete the guide to interview because they aren't 18 years old. You can also use functions in the question text itself. In this example here, the end user has told the software when they received the notice date. And then in the back end, in the question text, the author has done the notice date plus 30 and then turned that into a date to display to the end user using the date function. So you can use math here in the question section to figure out when they have to file a response based on 30 days after the notice date and then convert that to an actual date to tell them when they must file the response by. This is the age function. We saw that in the first slide about using it in logic. This function allows you to convert a date to an age in years. So for example, the form requires a birth date for users, but is limited to being used by people over 18 years old only. You can then, instead of asking the successful end user, if they're over 18 and then their birth date, you can just ask everyone the one question about their birth date and then use the age function and a logic statement to test if they're over 18. It saves the end user who ultimately will be using the interview from answering that additional question. The syntax is just the word age, parentheses, bracket, name of the variable, close bracket, close parentheses. It's used with a date variable to convert a date to an age in years. The date function converts days into month, month, day, day, year, 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 year format. It's important to remember that it is the month, then day, then year format if you're using this outside the US. For example, you can use it to determine a deadline for an answer 30 days from the notice date. Syntax is the same sort of formatting with the function date, parentheses, name of the variable, or bracket, name of the variable, close bracket, and then this example is adding 30 to um, the, the variable, the date variable, and then converting that to a date. So you can see it in the screenshot here, how it would function an interview. But you can also just convert um, any number of days into the month, month, day, day, year, year format as well. The today function returns today's date. So this is used to determine if a user say is within a statute of limitations. So today minus a variable date will tell you, for example here, if it's been more than 90 days since the incident happened. 
Today is also used to set limits on a calendar. Um, you can use it as a minimum or a maximum, and it will restrict the user's input on a calendar when they're um, entering some date in a field. It will either prevent them from entering dates in the future, if the maximum is today, or prevent them from answering with a date in the past if the minimum is today. Has answered returns a true false value if a variable has a value. So you're literally testing if the user has answered this variable. This is a common example when you have to have the client's full name and some people have a middle name, some people don't and you don't want to have an extra weird space where the middle name would be in full name, you can test if they've answered middle name. If they have, set full name to first, space, middle, space, last. Otherwise, set full to first, space, last. It avoids that, empty, that extra space, extra empty space, if they don't answer middle name. Same syntax, has answered, parentheses, open bracket, variable name, close bracket, close parentheses. Contains, it's a relatively new variable. It evaluates if a variable contains a specific text string. So for example, if an author wants to identify people who say they have issues related to domestic violence, when answering a general what's your legal problem question, you can search a variable for a text string value. So my example here is I'm saying if legal problem TE contains the word violence, I want to take them to a follow-up question about uh, that issue. So the syntax is contains, parentheses, bracket, name of the variable, close bracket, comma, and then whatever word or phrase specifically I'm looking for in quotes, because I'm looking for a specific text string, close parentheses. Ordinal returns the ordinal form of a number and it's usually used with a repeating, a repeat loops counting variable. So if you want to return first, second, fifth, 714th, whatever the ordinal version of the number is, you can do that by using ordinal parentheses child count. There's no bracket around child count here in the syntax example because child count is one word. You only absolutely need the brackets when you don't have, or when you do have a space in your variable name. Here, there's no space in the variable name, so it isn't required. Sum lets you return the total value of all the values entered for a repeating variable. So if you're asking the end user to list their expenses and you're storing that in a repeat loop in a, a variable called um, client expense value NU, for example here, you can then set a new value, client total expense value NU, to the sum of that one repeating variable. So they tell your, your expense their expenses one at a time. You can ask follow-up questions like what is the expense? Is it paid weekly, bi-weekly, whatever? Um, and then you can use A to J and the sum function to add up all those individual values inside the variable into a new total and then display it to them to confirm. A couple of syntax reminders. The function names like dollar, ordinal, sum are applied to the variables with parentheses. So you wrap the variable in parentheses after the function name. If you have a variable with spaces in it, you must also wrap that variable in brackets inside of the parentheses. And to show the value of the variable or a function applied to the variable in question text, you wrap that in a variable macro. So here, for example, if I want to display the dollar amount of their total assets, so I'm converting it into the standard dollar with a period and two um, decimal places after that, I can do uh, percent sign, percent sign, dollar, the function, parentheses, bracket, the total asset variable, close the bracket, close the parentheses, and then wrap it in double um, percent signs. You can see a list of all the functions supported by A to J author by going to our website, a to J author.org slash content slash functions. It's also available in the authoring guide as well under the function section. The next section will cover repeat loops, advanced logic, and tips and tricks. So what is a repeat loop? A repeat loop, also known as a repeat dialogue, 
is a series of questions that will display to the end user multiple times based upon that user's input. You use a repeat loop if you want to collect the same type of information several times and you don't want to have to create the same questions over and over again. Commonly, a repeat loop is used when you want to collect maybe information about multiple children and you want to ask a series of questions about each individual child. Or you can use it to collect income information, asking for their, in, their sources of income one at a time, expenses, asking for each expense one at a time, or perhaps assets that need to be dispersed in a divorce. You can ask for each information about each one of those assets one at a time without having to create multiple series of questions for the same information. There are two ways in A to J Author to do repeat loops, and both have the same outcome, but they have a different front-end interaction with the end user. So the first way we're going to talk about is collecting the number of items or the number of people, the number of times the end user has to go through the loop first. You ask them up front for that number. The second way is to ask if there are any more items or people at the end of the question uh, series of loops. And when I get to each one of these, I'll talk about uh, the best case for where they use them. So the first way is collecting the number up front. You're going to use this when your end user is going to know right away how many times they need to go through the loop. And you ask for that number. So for example, the, the um, the example I always use is when how many children somebody has. That theoretically should be a fairly easy question for somebody to answer. Um, they're not going to have to think about it or go through a list first to figure out if they have more children to add at the end. So you can ask them up front how many children they have and right away uh, you as the author are telling the software how many times it has to go through the loop. Okay, so the first two steps, you create the set of questions that will, will repeat. So I like as an author to have a script or an outline going forward so I know what questions I have to ask before I actually dive into the software. So I know ahead of time that, um, for example, if I'm asking about children, I know that the form's going to ask for their name, their birth date, and their father's name, for example. So I, I create those three questions. So I um, create the variables that I'm going to need. So child name, first name, child last name, child middle name if you need it, uh, child date of birth, and uh, father, child father, uh, T-E name. So I create those. I make the questions, three separate questions, and then I go back to the variables tab and I create a counting variable. The counting variable is going to be a way for, for the software to track how many times the user has gone through a set of questions. It has to be a number on the variables tab, so it, uh, the type has to be number. We also uh, generally use a different naming convention than we do for, for um, other variables. One, because this variable is not going to be used in hot dogs. So um, it doesn't have to follow any kind of naming convention. Also, um, it lets me see right away that it is a counting variable and it's not a variable that's used in question text to, that's not filled in by the end user. So I, uh, the, the naming convention I follow is, for example, here, child count. Both child and count are capitalized, no space, and no two-letter uh, indicator at the end to indicate the number, time, I, uh, the number type. I don't have NU after it. So just child count. Whatever you name it, it does have to be a number variable type. The third step is to create the first question in the in the loop. This first question is a jumping off point. It's not going to be repeated to the end user. They're not going to have to answer how many children several times. So they only need to answer it once. It's a jumping off point. So on this how many question, you on step four, um, at, at, the, at the destination um, on, on the button section, under destination, so the destination question should be the first question that's actually going to be repeated. So you can see in this screenshot in the bottom right that it is two dash child's name. That's my very first question that will be repeated. Repeat options. By default, it says normal, but there is a little drop down menu. You're going to click on that and you're going to select set counting variable to one. And you're going to tell A to J what counting variable to use. So I start typing child count, it auto populates, um, and now A to J is set when the end user clicks 
this button, the continue, after they say how many kids they have, they hit continue, A to J is going to set child count to one. So it knows that this is now, they're jumping into that first loop. Then step five, on all the questions that are to be repeated. So um, actually in my example here, I have two questions that will be repeated, the child's name and the child's birth date. On both of those questions, under the text section, you can see here is right under help audio, there's a field called counting variable. It's usually left blank, but when you're doing repeat loops, you need to tell A to J that this question is part of the, a loop, and the loop it is part of is the loop tied to the counting variable child count. So you put the child count variable there, and on every question that is to be repeated. You can see in the map section that uh, in the yellow column here, how many children is a number pick variable, and it has no loop. So you can tell when something is part of a repeat loop because we have a little icon that looks like this circle arrow with the word loop. So that tells me that I have put child count in that counting variable field on child's name and child's birth date. The next type of uh, question, or the next type of repeat loops that we're gonna talk about is that asking to add more at the end. So you can see that the loop is also on these two purple questions, two dash S at name and three dash anymore. This is just a way to see quickly if uh, your question is part of a loop. This little loop symbol also shows up on the pages tab at the end of the question's name if it's part of a loop. Step six is on the very last question that's going to be repeated. So in my case, it's child's birth date. If you remember, I had one dash how many children, two dash child's name, and three dash birth date, child's birth date. On this last question, I'm going to tell A to J that when they click the button, the continue button, do they give me their kid's birth date, I want to increment counting variable and add the, variable, the counting variable child count. So I tell A to J that basically they've finished the loop once uh, and go ahead and mark that the loop is complete. Um, so we have incremented the counting loop. We've told A to J that the end user has finished the loop. Now we have to create some logic to test against, uh, to test child count against how many times they told us they needed to go through the loop, which is stored in the variable, in my example, number of children and you. So we create this condition that you can see in the screenshot at the bottom of the screen here. So if child count equals number of children, so they've gone through the loop the number of times they said they had to go through the loop, I want to send them to a question called one dash do you have any so move them out of the loop into the next section otherwise so if child count they haven't gone through the number of times they said they needed to go through send them back to that first question in that's to be repeated which is two dash child's name so if true send them out of the loop if false take them back to the beginning question of the loop and let them go again, which will set the counter again each time after they hit the continue button. The second way of doing repeat loops, which is asking to add more at the end. You use this in the case when an end user is likely not to know how many times they have to go through the loop, and you ask them if they wanna add another one at the end. So for example, many people don't know offhand how many assets over $100 they have. But if they start making a list, and I'll show you a way to remind people of what they've already told you. So if they start making a list, they may eventually be like, yes, okay, and this, and this, and this, and this, rather than asking them, you know, I have 3,000 things over $100 or 10 things over $100. You wouldn't know necessarily off the top of your head how many times you have to go through the loop. Same thing create as uh, the other way. Step one, create that set of questions you want repeated. So um, for this example, I have the name of the asset and how much it's worth is uh, the only question in my loop. Um, so then you also create a counting variable, just like the other way. This one is called asset count, it's also a number. Um, on the first question, which is the jumping off point, the do you have any, because you don't want to send somebody through a loop if they don't actually have any assets or any things to tell you about. So the first question has two paths a yes and a no path. This is the do you have any question. If yes, go into the loop, which we'll talk about here on step three. If no, branch them out of the loop uh, to the next set of questions. 
So on that yes button, the destination is to dash asset name, which is my first question to be repeated in this loop. I'm going to set the counting variable to one again. I'm initializing the count and the counting variable is asset count. On the no button, you would just branch them out to the next one. There's nothing uh, you would have to do. The destination is the next question and the repeat options is normal because they're not ever gonna touch the loop. On all of the questions that you want repeated, you throw this counting variable into the counting variable field. You do not put it on that, do you have any question? You can see again that the loop symbol is showing up on the map. Step five on the last question. So um, in my example, I have that, do you have any question? That's number one. Two is asset name and it's gonna asset value. It's a two part question there. It's a two field question. And the third question in my section here is, do you have any more to add? Do you have another? Um, this, do you have another question is repeated to the end user. So it is the last question in your loop. Um, and it is, uh, it will have that counting variable assigned to it. So it is part of the loop because it gets asked each time. On this one, there are again two paths. Yes, takes them back through the loop. No, takes them out of the loop. So on the yes button, on this last question that's being repeated to the end user, the destination is that asset name, that second question, the first question in the loop. Um, we're gonna increment the counting variable and we're gonna tell A to J which counting variable to increment, which is asset count. So again, this is telling the software the end user has been through the loop and has finished the loop. On the no button, you just branch them out, they're done. So you take them to whatever the next step or next section is, next question, um, and the repeat options are normal. And then you're done, there's no logic in the asking to add more section. Um, you just keep having the end user manually push themselves through the loop. So variables in general, in a repeat dialog, in any question that's repeated are treated exactly norm uh, the same. Um, they're set up the same way, child's name first, TE. The only difference, which I'll show you in A to J here, my sample, is on the variables tab. If it is to be repeated, you have to make sure that the variable is set to check if multiple values. Let me zoom in on that. This tells A to J to allow multiple values to be held by this variable. If you don't check this, every time the end user goes through a loop, they're gonna override the answer before. So if it only if you don't have this checked, A to J only allows one answer, so each time it overrides an answer, the last answer. If this is checked, multiple values can be held by this variable and A to J will start indexing them and separating them out. So that's the only difference with variables. That uh, asset count or child count, whatever your counting variable is, do not, check this because it's a normal number. It does not need to hold multiple values. It only needs to hold the one value, um, whatever the count is. And the only difference on a question in general um, that is part of a repeat loop is that you have this repeating uh, counting variable in the question text section that you indicate that it's part of the loop. Um, and the way, so what I was going to show you is a way in which you can help your end user remember which part of the loop they're on or which asset or which child they're talking about or what they've already told you about. So for example, on this, do you have any more for the assets? I'm gonna give them help. They might think, um, which ones have I already told you about? And I'm going to help them by pulling out all of the values they've told me about using a macro. But it's simple, all you have to say is, uh, all you as the author have to type in, is you've told me about your, and then use a macro to call out all of the values held in the variable asset name TE. This is particularly helpful on the um, asking to add more at the end because it reminds them what they've already told you about. Most people aren't gonna have a pad of paper sitting next to them at the computer and they're not gonna be jotting down what they've already told you about. So this gives them that information quickly. And A to J automatically adds a, a comma and the word and if there's more than one. Um, it starts building the list grammatically for you. The other way to use a macro in uh, repeat loops is to use the ordinal function. So for example, 
I am using a macro to call out the ordinal value held by child count, which you remember is a number. So what this will display to the end user the first time they're through the loop, will say what is the name of the first child. Next time they go through, what is the name of the second child, and so forth. Um, and then I use this macro to call out the child's name specifically in the next question. So the first question, they tell me the name of their child, and then in the next question, I say, what is that child's date of birth? So what is Allison or Benjamin's or Thomas's date of birth? And I do that with a macro, um, percent sign, percent sign, bracket, child's name first, TE, which is my variable, pound the counting variable, close brackets, double percent signs. So what this tells A to J is call out the value of child for name first TE, pound, because it's indexing those multiple values, whatever count they're currently on. So each time it will only call out the name of the child held by whatever iteration of the loop the end user is in, rather than with the asset one where I didn't have pound asset count, it calls out all the values. So this is a way to call out a specific value rather than all of the values held by a variable. The last section we have to cover in this video is advanced logic. The advanced logic section in A to J Author 6 allows you to script if else statements either before the end user sees the question or after the end user presses the button. The advanced logic section has five commands that you can use if, else, go to, set, and end if. That's it. Just like every sentence has to have a capital, at the, capital letter at the beginning and some punctuation at the end, all if statements have to have an if at the beginning and an end if at the end. And each logic statement command must be on its own line. So you need a hard return or the enter key between if, else, go to, set, and end if. A great feature in A to J Author 6 that allows you to see all of the logic in your interview without having to open up each individual question is the all logic tab. So you access this from within your interview and then you open, you click on the all logic tab. And this allows you to see every logic statement that's available in your interview. You can also make changes and edits if needed, and you'll be able to see if any of your logic statements have issues. If A to J author detects an improper logic statement, it will turn the box red, and it will also give you some sort of indicator about what the problem is, like unknown syntax, unrecognized variable, those kind of warnings give you some sort of indicator as to what's wrong with your interview. When you make the corrections and you click out of the box, if everything is okay, then the box will turn white again. If you have questions about what a lot, one of the logic warnings means, you can always email me, jessica at cali.org. We also have an FAQ on our website under the learn resources, the learn tab at the top of the page that tells you what common error messages are and how to fix them. With advanced logic, you can do simple mathematical expressions. So for example, if you want to set a variable that is their annual income, you can use math to multiply what they've told you their monthly income is by 12. You can do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. You can also use and or or in a logic statement to combine two different conditions to test against. So here in the sample logic statement, I'm testing whether the number of children is greater than one and the household size is less than three. If so, I wanna take them to some other question um, there. So you can use and or or to make more advanced logic statements. Here are some of the examples of uh, symbols that can be used in advanced logic statements. You can use the equal symbol, not equal, greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, and the word is also means uh, equals. Now we'll talk about some tips and tricks for creating guided interviews in general. We recommend that you start with some sort of script or outline. How detailed that script or outline is is up to you. Some authors have a full script that details every question, every word, every variable that's gonna be answered, and is specifically how that field is gonna look and how those interview questions are gonna look. Um, maybe that's drafted by their subject matter expert or maybe it's drafted by the developer themselves. Some just have a simple outline of what they need to cover in each section um, and bullet points. 
It's up to you, but we do recommend that you start with something before you get to the interview itself so that it keeps you on track and make sure that you're not doing a lot of moving around or trying to edit in questions after the fact. If you're looking to translate your interview, A to J Authors supports 15 different languages. You can find those languages under the About section. On the first page of the About section, it has a Languages option. You can see the 15 different languages that A to J supports. That means that A to J translates the chrome around the interview. So the back, the next, the exit, continue, yes, no, that kind of thing. But we don't translate the actual text of the question itself. That's up to you as authors to get that translated. If you're looking for help with those translations, you can hire uh, translators or you can have someone in your office do it. And if they're not familiar with the software, you can pull a text report under the reports tab that just has the text of the questions that need to be edited and the field labels and the button labels and that kind of thing, anything that would need to be translated. But it doesn't have the variables or any of the background metadata about the interview. It's a very clean version for translators to work off of. And then finally, a uh, full report is available for you also under the report tab. If you're looking to share for editing or peer reviewing purposes, or you wanna send it off to a subject matter expert to review the entire interview without having to make them click through all the different branches of the interview, you can generate a full report and they can read the interview itself. Additional resources that might be helpful for you is our authoring guide first. The authoring guide is about 300 pages. It's a software manual. Um, and it's available at a to j author.org slash content slash a to j dash authoring dash guide. It's also available under the learn tab on our website at the top. Um, and this will give you complete instructions on how to use any aspect of the software. Sample exercises also available under the learn tab. These are exercises that you can learn that you can use to learn a to j author hot docs and the a to j dat better. We also, if you're interested in the A to J DAT, which will be covered in the next training video, um, you can also check out chapter 15 of the authoring guide that focuses specifically on the uh, document assembly tool. And then you're all welcome to attend our new user webinars. They're generally the first Thursday of each month and they run February through December of each year at 11 a.m. Central Time. As always, if you have questions, you can feel free to email me, jessica at cali.org. Thank you.